The physical structures that humans have built throughout the world and the fundamental drive that operates within our societies to keep the system and its infrastructure alive is a direct product of our collective consciousness. Everywhere you travel on earth you see two fundamental shapes that provide the form and the function to our societies, the circle and the square. You need only to look around you in the room you're in and as you go about your life out in the world. What you may begin to notice is that the form that provides structure to our societies is the square and in three dimensions, the cube. From bricks to buildings and city grids, walls to doors, windows, paper, books, engine blocks and automobiles, televisions, computers, the list is endless. The square is the fundamental shape that gives form and holds our human societies within the rigid binds of psychological space and psychological time. But more on this later. Also, you may notice that nearly everything that moves within our human-made world uses the movement of the circle, sphere, cylinder, or tube to provide us mobility within this structure. It is interesting to note that combustion engines within an engine block begins with an explosion of fuel within a confined space to push a cylinder back and forth within a vehicle whose basic shape is a cube on circular tires down square avenues through endless city grids on a large sphere in space. Square keys and circular locks on square doors hang on hinges and open via doorknobs from twisting wrists. Not even a roll of tape can escape the circle and the square. And why is it that we have chosen the cube and the sphere to represent our time and presence here? It is because this infrastructure was built from consciousness. But as of yet, we have not allowed ourselves to see our responsibility. At some time in our lives, we have all looked outside ourselves and felt that we have been a slave within a system a system that seems so overwhelmingly rigid and unchanging, unrelenting and unforgiving, a system that takes from us to feed itself and in return offers us only options and choices that benefit itself, teasing our hope with enough to keep us alive. We may have also felt at some time restricted by our roles and relationships, by our titles, our identities, or even by our names. These types of experiences are a dynamic relationship of interdependence between the rigidity of our physical infrastructure and the infrastructure of our collective consciousness. From this infrastructure of consciousness we have built a physical representation of ourselves, an extension of our inner world into physical reality. Herein is the repetition of history, the futility of outward revolutions in long-term change the stratification of wealth, all forms of discrimination, social unrest, religious hypocrisy, and the chemical destruction of the earth. All of this bleeding of life can be simply reduced, not to human nature, but rather a false form of identity, an infrastructure of consciousness we are born into, an infrastructure that blankets the world from within our minds and rebuilds itself in matter out of its own image. Whether we are speaking biologically, cosmologically, religiously, or metaphysically, from one always comes two. A cell divides, the Big Bang boomed, and the one divided into many. Though this apparent division is a perceived phenomenon, what is the space that divides one into two and two into many? What is the space of perceived difference between objects in space? Is this perception of spatial difference real, or is our perception of outer spatial difference caused by a type of space that divides us internally within our minds? Let us begin with a different, less compartmentalized view of reality, shall we? Let's fill the space that divides us physically, 
spiritually and scientifically from the concepts that scientifically minded people created from their own consciousness. A consciousness that is not ultimately different from yours or mine, and I should add, a consciousness that is not objective in any way whatsoever. Again, the origin of such scientific concepts arose from human consciousness, right? So, if the origin of scientific terminology shares the same consciousness as human consciousness, then we can see that the space that divides the studies of, say, medicine from psychology and from psychology from cosmology is the same space that divides religious concepts from political, racial, gender, or national concepts, right? In fact, any perception of conceptual difference in areas of academic, scientific, or spiritual study dissolve the closer you approach the spatial boundaries that seem to divide them. This spatial defense is so important to our collective identities that we have instituted roles for individuals to play locally and nationally as defenders of this perceived space so we can be eased of the burden of having to protect the boundaries of identity we have accumulated. Well, before I get too off track, let's imagine that the physical descriptions of the phenomenon of both gravity and magnetism can be correlated to a distinct aspect of human consciousness for these descriptions in no objective way arose from some thinking, feeling person like you and I. Together, a part of everything. Separate, apart, is everything. Together, we separate parts, we things. Separate in the space that makes the things as parts apart from everything. Help me, please. I'm looking for nothing. You see, I've lost nothing. I've placed reward signs for nothing throughout the neighborhood. Why do we believe in nothing? Everything and everything. This and that. Mine and yours. Between theirs and ours. His and hers. Both tombs and places of worship. Categories are catacombs. Severed space into corridors for consciousness to roam. In the space torn between everything and everything is the place where an individual's consciousness was born. Individuals in divisive vigils. Cosmologically speaking, gravity is said to be determined by the relationship between an object's mass and the density within the volume of its mass. Generally, the greater the density of an object, the greater its gravitational field. So the more matter or mass you can fit in the, into the same amount of space, the denser it is and the greater its gravitational field. That is, if we're talking about the same type of matter. But again, let's keep this simple for now. Planetary gravity is also related to mass. For instance, the density of Jupiter is only one quarter that of Earth, but its mass is 318 times that of our own planet. This is because our planet is made of metals and minerals and liquid water, whereas Jupiter is made from less dense gases. In this case, because the mass of Jupiter is so much greater than that of Earth, its mass contributes to its gravity, yet only so much as to make its gravity roughly two and a half times that of our much smaller planet. So what this says is that the greater the density of an object relative to its mass, the greater its gravitational pull on other objects relative to it in space. And remember, density is measured by volume, and volume, spatially, is always cubed. Now, Let's look at the different ways in which we are stuck. Years now and no meat. We are all fixed in our ways to some greater or lesser extent. The fixed nature of our beliefs represents the density of our identities. And like planetary bodies, the greater our density, the greater our personal gravity that holds the mass of our identity together. Thus, the more fixed we are in our identity, 
the more dense we are said to be. Also, the relationships that we form and gravitate towards are a reflection of this gravity that pulls others into orbit around us and us into orbit around other mass identities of similar density. Birds of a feather, right? So now, let's imagine we can isolate the individual components of this complex dynamic we call identity. Let's say, I'm a liberal democrat, hey, a, liberal. a Buddhist, a vegan, an environmental activist, and a feminist. They all seem like quite possible combinations of identities that might fit together cohesively, right? And then my brother happens to be a conservative, a conservative Republican, Christian, omnivore, who doesn't believe in a woman's right to govern her own body. Another well joined combination of traits. Now these may be ideological polarities, but they are by no means unconceivable. Each of these people in this hypothetical scenario contain ideological boundaries, spaces that divide them from each other by excluding that which is in opposition to them, and each of them defends the meaning of their beliefs that in turn helps to reinforce the spatial boundaries of ideology that supports the infrastructure of their individual identities and the larger network of relationships they orbit. Okay, so far we have one aspect of personal conscious identity that becomes fixed in a self-concept or self-ideation within a larger system that is our complete notion of self and worldview, and herein we form gravitational bonds of shared orbits with others of compatible mass and density. Mass here, not referring to physical matter, but rather what matters to us. Our fixed nature has a type of gravity that holds our ideas of ourself and our worldview together. What I mean to say is gravity as we know it in planetary bodies is synonymous with the density of our personal identities. The material or mass of one unit of self-ideation is the meaning inherent within the volume of space one idea of ourself contains. Each self-concept contains a mass of meaning, what matters to us, right? This is within a volume of space that divides it from other self-concepts that collectively form the whole of our personal identity. The meaning of our self-concept is contained within a conceptually isolated space that defines it. This spatial definition that houses one notion of self has a limited volume. And remember, volume is a cubed measurement. The volume of one self-concept is the inner spatial limits that define how much acceptance is available to the amount of self confined and isolated within it. Also, the more restrictive the volume or the more meaning that can be crammed into it the denser and more fixed it becomes. Hence, the denser its mass, the greater its gravity that holds it together and draws us into orbit around certain experiences. But what is the actual gravitational field of self-identity? Well, the gravitational field that holds the self together is desire. But before it became desire as we know it, this field of elemental energy originated as a primordial longing for unconditional fulfillment. Its origins, inseparable from our own, are covered in a later discussion. So, to continue, desire is the name given to the primary element in consciousness that becomes tuned or attuned, if you will, to the meaning inherent within the volume of one unit of self-identity. In other words, as an elemental vibrational force, desire is the energetic medium that holds the mass of meaning of identity together. For instance, all of the attributes we describe ourselves with are inscribed as meaning upon energy housed within the spatial boundaries within one self-concept as well as within one thought. Desire's vibration is imprinted and retuned to carry on its waves the information of our identity. Herein, mass or meaning within one self-concept is the amount of information stored upon the waves of desire. Hence, the more meaning that can be imprinted upon these waves, the more mass 
that is contained within the volume of one identity. Now, within one notion of self, as within one thought, is the vibration of desire that holds the mass and material of meaning together within the limited volume of that self-concept. Herein, the meaning is the mass of identity held within a specific volume that helps to determine the density of the meaning and therefore the frequency and the strength of gravity that holds it all together. The conflicts that arise within us are due to the spatial boundaries within ourselves and are only one step away from manifesting as conflicts imposed on others we perceive as outside of ourself. In other words, the conflicts that arise within us over the internal space that defines one aspect of ourself from another aspect of ourself is the same space that defines the acceptance of others outside ourself. It is, after all, this empty space, empty of love imbued with conditions, that divides all things conceptually and benefits from the suffering such division demands. The perception of spatial differences within our mind and outside in the world, the multitudes of identities within us and outside of us and the components within one concept of identity in total form the infrastructure of consciousness. As it is, the whole of our personal identity was formed by the same infrastructure of consciousness that formed all other people on this planet. And so the whole of our personal identity, formed from a collective infrastructure, fits functionally, though with necessary inherent conflict, within the collective consciousness of humanity. The difference of ourselves from others and the groups we identify with is defined by the same spatial boundaries that define one self-concept from another within us. This space is the antithetical force.